Welcome back. In the ancient world, all roads may have read, uh, led to Rome. But today in Washington, Ben Rhodes refused to travel down Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House to a congressional committee hearing. Miranda Kahn returns with more on the controversial Mr. Rhodes and the reaction on Capitol Hill. J.D., unlike Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rhodes isn't what many Republicans refer to as a friendly neighbor, and this may be the reason why. The president's view of this Iran deal is this is the best way to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Ben Rhodes may not be a name familiar to you, but it is to many Republicans, especially after this New York Times piece. His background is in creative writing, Bill. That's great if you're working for the Hallmark or the Lifetime channels. It's not so good when you're the national security advisor for the president of the United States. Since then, Rhodes, the now famous foreign policy guru, has put himself and the Obama administration in the hot seat for his remarks about the president's Iran deal, specifically for what he says that suggests Rhodes may have orchestrated an Iran deal story in a way to sway the public and Congress unjustly. They manipulated uh, the public in such a way to form this uh, support, supposed support for the Iranian deal that was not rooted in fact. Since then, three Republican senators have asked the president to fire Rhodes based on comments that he misled lawmakers on the Iran deal. But that doesn't appear likely. Ben Rhodes is the person who told the truth about uh, the Iran deal. Uh, and it's Republicans who are either badly misinformed or outright lying about the Iran deal. Rhodes has also been asked to testify in front of the House Oversight Committee, something he declined to do. It's difficult for me to understand how you have a privilege when it comes to talking to people who are elected by your fellow citizens, but that privilege doesn't apply when you're talking to reporters. And J.D., Republicans admit there's little they can accomplish with Rhodes, without Rhodes' testimony, rather, which is why it's possible he may be subpoenaed to do so. J.D., back to you. Thanks very much, Miranda. We will stand by for that subpoena. And we're standing by for your phone calls. A reminder that you can get in touch with us right now at 1-877-NEWSMAX. That's 1-877-639-7629. And let's welcome back our panel, again via Skype, from Atlanta, the former chairman of the Tea Party Express, Amy Kramer, and from Newsmax New York, attorney and political strategist Sam Nunberg. Thanks for being with us. And I tell you what, so many calls are coming. Coming in on this prime question tonight, should Donald Trump sue the New York Times? Let's get right back to the phones out west to Henderson, Nevada for Greg. Greg, what do you say? I don't think he should. He should not. Why is that, sir? No, because he reduces himself to their level. I mean, this is one of, one of the lawyers you had on this week said something like it's an op-ed being masqueraded as journalism. And he's being he's being defended all along the way by people he's worked with, by what he's accomplished. Why should he concern himself with it? Leave it alone, Don. All right. That's good advice uh, from Greg out in Henderson, Nevada. But again, Amy, the whole thing is Trump is a genius at keeping his name in the headlines. And so even talking about considering the suit keeps this story alive, does it not? It does. I mean, he is a genius at keeping his name in the headlines. But ultimately, J.D., I think the people are going to have the final say when they elect him in November and he becomes the next president of the United States. He, I think what we need to focus on right now, and I hope what the campaign is focusing on, is going out there and educating voters on why Donald Trump is the better candidate for, for president of the United States. When you talk about security and keeping our families safe and jobs and trade, bringing jobs back to America, bringing manufacturing back to America, health care, all those things, those are the important issues that we need to be focused on, talking to, to independents and Democrats and get them on board the Trump train so that we can elect him in November. And I think that's really the road that we should, that he, the campaign should head down. But we know he's going to keep his name in the media. He will find a way. He's proven that. He's so Amy's fantastic. advice, your advice is back to basics, the, uh, the science of electioneering. But meanwhile, let Trump be Trump and he will be in the and, news. Let's, let me circle media, back. Yep. Yeah. One other point. Can Go I ahead. Say, every time that the press does something like this, it backfires on whoever's doing it. I mean, his support just grows. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier, that the people don't trust Washington, they don't trust the press, and therefore his poll numbers are climbing. All right, now let's go back to the story that uh, Miranda was reporting. This whole situation that developed. There's Jason Chaffetz as chairman of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. 
And he says, look, Ben Rhodes, you're going to talk to the New York Times. Come testify to us. Listen to what Chairman Chaffetz was saying earlier today. There are a lot of outstanding questions. We wanted to get the person who is right in the thick of things from the White House to come here and testify. The White House on Thursday claimed that this wasn't about executive privilege. And then less than 24 hours before this hearing, they reversed course and said, oh, it is about executive privilege. Now, who's being inconsistent? You have plenty of time, Mr. Rose, to go out and talk to all the media friends and talk to the echo chamber that you brag about in the New York Times. But when it comes time to actually answer hard questions under oath, they decide not to do it. Sam Nunberg again as a political operative, but also as an attorney. I, I get it on executive privilege, but really doesn't Chaffetz has, have the sound argument right here? And do you expect him to issue a subpoena to bring Rhodes before the committee? I do expect him to issue a subpoena, and I do expect uh, the Republicans to, uh, to make this a larger issue. But the fact of the matter is the reality is that the Republicans are the ones who gave Obama the power to sign this treaty, which it really was a treaty, by, you know, by having the Senate pass the Iran Nuclear Review Act. And Iran has just tested missiles. We cannot get the videos of the way they treated our sailors. They are still the largest sponsor of terrorism. And the deal itself, what Rhodes said, look, as an operative, I don't see anything wrong, frankly, with what he said. He has to control the narrative. He has to create an echo chamber. But, 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 there, but no, there, there's a difference. Now, let me challenge you on that, Sam. There is a difference okay. between spinning and summoning arguments to persuade and making up knowingly false statements that there's a moderate faction in Iran. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're the guys we're going to talk to when that is blatantly false. But, you know, I, I've worked for the Middle East Forum and, I, you know, I followed this very closely for years. And if you were actually following it, you would have known that they had been negotiating with Iran since 2011. And this whole argument. You know, the yeah, you know what? I'm sorry. They, and I, I appreciate your knowledge of Middle Eastern affairs. But again, to mm -hmm. me, it sounds like the old Clinton argument. Let's release something at five o'clock in the afternoon and we'll say when it ends up on the front page of the paper, oh, that's old news. The same gimmick is at work. I understand spin. Listen, but the, look, the larger issue, the larger issue is this agreement and it's a national security risk. It's going to create an arms race within the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is going to start building nuclear weapons. And I'm sure you're going to see Libya, excuse me, not Libya, Qatar you know, eventually as well. And the, uh, and the, frankly, the matter is this was a bipartisan problem. I mean, Rhodes, by the way, worked for James Baker in the Baker Hamilton report during the Bush administration. Ro you know, this is somebody who's a pan-Arabist and there, and there are these people on both sides, as you well know. So I, I don't know what we're going to do now. The, the agreement signed. And frankly, we have a problem. The fact that both Hillary Clinton has endorsed the agreement and Donald Trump says he's not going to tear it up. All so right. that's where we are right now. Okay, fair enough. Speaking of Trump, there's another report that's out, his personal financial disclosure report. He said he's proud to say it's the largest in the history of the Federal Elections Commission. Here's part of the statement he released. Despite the fact I'm allowed extensions, I have again filed my report, which is 104 pages on time. Bernie Sanders has requested, on the other hand, an extension for his small report. Uh, this is the difference between a businessman and the all talk, no action politicians that have failed the American people for too long. Now, for his part, Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski was on CNN earlier this afternoon, and he says what the Trump campaign released is more detailed than a tax form, including highlighting Mr. Trump's charitable giving. He raised money for the veterans. He personally pledged and donated a million dollars alone. So, Mr. You know, Mr. Trump's financial giving to charitable organizations is unquestioned. He's done over $100 million in the, math, the last number of years. And I think by any account, it's a lot of money. And I think, you know, many, many organizations have benefited from his ability to give to those groups, and he'll continue to do more. Amy, let me ask you, is this another example where there's the Donald getting out that big, voluminous report and saying, hey, I'm not a politician. Will this uh, really help him out? We've got about a minute left. 
Yeah, I mean, he's back in the media again, absolutely. And I do agree with him. You know, it is the difference between a businessman and a politician. And quite frankly, we don't need another politician in the White House. We don't, sorry, Sam, we don't, and J.D., we don't need another attorney in the White House. Oh, don't worry, I'm not an attorney. J.D. doesn't (laughs) stand for Juris Doctor in my name. It stands for J.D., but I am a recovering (laughs) congressman, Amy. So I, I hear your point. But um, yeah, I you know I agree with Donald Trump. I really do, and I think the American people do too. Well, fair enough. Uh, Sam, final fifteen seconds to you, brother. I think that you know Donald will get away with not having to release his tax returns because the bottom line is going against Hillary Clinton. There's nobody more corrupt or crooked, as he says. And I'd like to know everything about the Clinton Foundation more than to know what Donald Trump's uh, gross income was on yeah. his uh, individual tax returns. Somehow, I think we're going to be waiting for a whole lot of Friday afternoon document dumps, and there's going to be collective disinterest <laughs> by the uh, by the dominant media culture. Hey, you guys have been great. Amy, Sam, thanks for your time. Coming back with more right after this.